Well, let's turn to the book of Matthew, and we are here in Matthew chapter 10 in a very special section of the Word of God in which we are investigating uh, the lives of the disciples. And if you uh, haven't really uh, studied their lives, I hope this section actually is very interesting to you because uh, we are taking uh, from Scripture, from the Gospel, all the verses which some of these disciples are mentioned and, and building a character study around them. And so um, the goal of this, of course, is to show us that these are very much ordinary people with ordinary means and, and ordinary desires and, and really ordinary faults uh, in their lives. And they're like you and they're like me. And so uh, you might find yourself to be more like one of the disciple than the other, but God is at work in your life to change you and to shape you as he does so uh, with the disciples which we see here. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 10, and we're in verses 1 through 4. And it has these words, he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. In this world, in order for you to be hired for a job, you must show proper qualifications, at least most of the time. I was working in an aerospace company, it's Raytheon, and I was working there for 14 years. And while I was there, I had encountered many people who came in and out of the company. I worked there from 2005 to 2019 and saw many people come in and through. Most of the people Raytheon hired in our department, and I work in the same department for a number of years, or actually for all 14 years, are those who have shown proper qualification. Whether they work in a company elsewhere and they did the same thing, or they're young college graduate who graduated from a college, uh, whether it be a state college or UC, and they studied something regarding electrical engineering or material science or chemical engineering, and they have a degree and bachelor or master's, and they applied, and the company thought that they would be a good contribution after interviewing them, and they got hired. So these are young guys who have shown qualifications in their, uh, in their degree, or older people who have worked in other companies, and they were hired in the same department. But once in a while, what I would see would be people who are hired who have absolutely no qualification, no reason why they should be hired except by the recommendation of an individual who works there saying, you really want to hire this individual to do the work. He's a good worker. He's easy to work with. He's smart. He catches on quickly. And these men or these women perhaps were doing other jobs. Maybe they were administrators in a different role. Maybe they were secretary. Maybe they were plumbers. One guy was a plumber. And they got hired in simply because of a recommendation that there's a worker in the company which we have said we want to consider this guy and the boss interview this guy and say, okay, we'll give you a chance. We'll let you come in and work for us. First, on probation, seeing how it works out for you, and then eventually you can become a permanent, permanent employee. And from my experience of both sets of people, the people who are hired in because they have the qualification and the people who are hired in because, well, they're recommended, it turns out that for the 14 years I worked there, the people who are there without the qualification turns out to be the most contributing individual. 
It's hard to imagine that is the case, but that is true. People who are college hires, the people who came from another company because they did this and that, and now they're working here or anything, a lot of times it's just a stepping stone from the getting into the company, get in the department, do their job for a couple of years, and they're gone doing something else. But the people who were there because of recommendation, they didn't have the qualification, but they got in. And they start learning and start growing and start developing their skill set as they're taught. They're there for the entire time I was there. In fact, they're there for longer than I was there because they're so appreciative of the opportunity that was given to them to do the work. They don't deserve it, but they're thankful that they're having the opportunity to work and to demonstrate their skill set and to develop their skill set under that environment. I think about us as Christians, we are pretty much like the second group of people. We don't really have much qualifications in terms of serving God. In fact, we were those, as Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, dead in our sins. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. We're following the course of this world and the desires of our flesh and the prince of the power of the air. We were following all these wrong things. We were by nature children of wrath. We don't deserve to be in the realm, in the kingdom of God at all in serving him. But God saved us. He made us alive in him. By grace, we have been saved. And when we think about us serving God, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, this is who you are. Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were noble birth. And this is who we are. We are both spiritually destitute and in the world's perspective, perspective, physically destitute as well. We were nobodies. And perhaps this is the reason why we would consider God because if we were somebody, then perhaps we think we got it all together. We don't really need God. But we're nobodies. We were not wise according to worldly standards. We were not powerful. We were not of noble birth, but we found God or God found us. And all of a sudden, even though we were considered foolish in the world, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 and 28, God's using us to shame the wise. God's using us who are weak to shame the strong. God's using what's low and despised in the world to powerfully demonstrate who he is so that no one can boast in the presence of God. When we think about this, we can only thank God for the privilege to serve him. We're nobody spiritually. We are dead in our trespasses and sins, but God saved us in Christ Jesus and made us alive in him. Change our desires as we embrace Jesus as our Lord. And then coming into the church, even though we don't really have anything to offer, God gives us this wonderful opportunity, wonderful community in which we can practice our spiritual gifts, encourage one another, share the gospel with others through this church, draw people to know him. And, and as we're doing so, we're rise, rising in our leadership skill set to continue to be used by the Lord in powerful ways and impacting people as people come to this church. This is a privilege that we get to be here to serve Him. I think about the men, the men God has chosen in Scripture, whether it be Peter, Andrew, James, and John. All of them are unworthy servants, just like you and just like me. We saw Peter. Peter is this impetuous man who gets himself in the wrong situation, but had a desire to serve God, and God uses him. We have Andrew. Andrew is this person, perhaps, is not really that of a, a leadership skill kind of guy, but he draws people to Jesus. And it's always bring people to Jesus. You have James. James is a hothead. He, he's always telling people about the judgment of God, but God also uses him as well. That's necessary. You have John. John is a disciple of love. 
but God uses him as well. So people are different in their variety of ways, but God uses each one of us. And I think we begin to compare ourselves with these disciples and wonder, in our own hearts, can we be used by God? And the answer is yes, because God uses these people, God can use us. We're going to look at Philip today. Philip is this pragmatic person, detail-oriented person. And perhaps you're more like Philip. Philip is a pessimist. He's pessimistic, uh, pessimistic about many things because he's pragmatic. When he looks at the world and he looks at the situation and he's thinking, you know what? This is not going to work out because this and this and this and this is not in line. So he needs to be taught the big picture. It's not all about being pragmatic, pragmatic and that is it. It's about seeing how God can work even though the details don't always add up. We're going to look at Philip today. And all of this is hinging on in what God is saying here, what Jesus is saying here in Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 to 38. At the end of his ministry, this summary of ministry of teaching and healing, as he walks up this mountain in Galilee, he looks down at the people and says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This is the desire of Christ. Jesus had been been ministering in the Galilee region for six months, a year by now. And according to Josephus, there are 204 cities and towns and about 3 million people living in the Galilee region. So Jesus alone, even though he's healing, even though he's preaching the gospel, telling people to repent for the kingdom of God is near, telling people that they're to mourn for their sins and and to be poor in spirit before God and to hunger and thirst after God's righteousness. And, And he was healing people as he was doing this and drawing people to himself. There's still not enough people who are hearing the gospel. And so what Jesus at the end of that ministry is saying, we need more people. We need more laborers for the gospel. We need more people to hear about this good news. So he's drawing the disciples to come to him. The first disciple we saw was Peter. Peter, again, we said, is this impetuous leader, impetuous kind of guy who is always speaking before he thinks. Sometimes he gets it right. Sometimes he gets it wrong. He gets it right in Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, when Jesus said, Who do you say that I am? Peter said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He got it right, but only a minute later to say, You shall not go to the cross. And Jesus had to say, Get behind me, Satan. But this is the man who's always taking chances. That's the leader. Leader is the one who has the vision and convinced other people to come alongside of him. He's not always the one who is right, but he's got to be the one who is making changes to his leadership. When he finds that he's wrong, a leader is not always right, the first decision, but he is able to make a better second decision. That's what a leader is. And that's what Peter is. He's changing, growing, as he leads other people to follow Christ. You have Andrew. Andrew is this relational leader. He may not be like Peter in terms of drawing crowds, Peter is the one who spoke in the Pentecost time to share with people who Lord Jesus is, but Andrew is in the background. Andrew is individually working with people, bringing people to Jesus. He is the one who brought Peter to Jesus in John chapter 1, verse 41, saying, we found the Messiah, and so Andrew is essential. I think about the person who led Spurgeon to Christ. Spurgeon is this man who was proliferating his ministry in England in the 1850s. The man who brought Spurgeon to Christ was an unknown preacher. But that's Andrew. We can be Andrew, used by God in such a way. You have James. James is an aggressive hothead who is always teaching people and commanding people to follow Jesus, telling people about the judgment of God. He's the person who's waving signs or debating people in public places getting people riled up and angry, but we need such person in the kingdom of God as well. They 
shake people out of their stupor. So James was the first one to be killed for the gospel. Among all the disciples in Acts chapter 12, verse 2, we see that James was killed by the sword by Herod. And Peter was actually just in prison. So Peter was not as much as a threat as James was, even though Peter was the leader of the apostles. And then we saw John. John is this person who is always talking about love, love. First John chapter 4, verse 11, he said, love one another. He wants us to focus on love, and certainly we need such person in the church of God as well. So we see with so many people, and we only see so, much, so far four of them, who are so different from one another, but is used by God tremendously for his purpose. They're different. But there is a similarity about them, which is that they all want to give their lives to the Lord. Fifthly, we're going to see here in verse 3, is Philip. Philip is the next person in line after Jesus picked out Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Now, it's Philip here in verse 3. So who is Philip? We may not know much about Philip. You just see his name here and there. But Philip, as we see in Scripture, is known for his pragmatism. Now, we need people who are pragmatic because we need to count the cost, all right? To know what we can handle and what we cannot handle. To know how much money we have, how much resources we have. Right? Jesus even said, before you go and fight the f- a battle, count how many men you have. Before you build a tower, count how much resources you have. So Philip is the one who is always counting. He's an administrative ex- uh, expert. Do we have this? Do we have that? That's Philip. But because Philip is a pragmatic person, it also leads him to be a pessimist, right? The optimistic person is the one who doesn't know the details, say, we can do this. The pragmatic person says, we can't do it because we don't have the resources. So therefore, he tends to be more pessimistic. But we see how Philip is introduced to us in John chapter 1. The first time we hear about Philip is in verse 43, in which it says, Jesus found Philip and said to Philip, follow me. So Jesus knew Philip, found Philip, and said, you are going to be my disciple, so follow me. And Philip went to Nathaniel. We're going to talk about Nathaniel later. In verse 45, and said, we have found the Messiah. So this is how the mind of a pragmatist works. See, God is doing something. God obviously found Philip. God's sovereignty says that I changed Philip's heart because obviously nobody will go to God on their own. We're all dead in our trespasses and sins. We will not go to God on our own. But the pragmatist says, hey, hey, I found Jesus. I did this. It was my action. Of course, it is his action. I'm not saying it is not. We all have to find the Messiah. But generally speaking, theologically speaking, when we look at the big picture, it's God who found us. So Jesus says, I found you, Philip. Philip said, no, I found you, Jesus. But that's the mind of a pragmatist. It's what he does for God. So he begins with that, but Jesus says, I have much to teach you. I have much to teach you how you can trust God who works outside of your pragmatic ideals. The first lesson is found in John chapter 6, the feeding of the 5,000. More like 20,000, perhaps. 5,000 men. 20,000 people were there. Jesus had been preaching, teaching. I'm on the hillside of Galilee, and there are 20,000 people gathered there listening to Jesus. And you can imagine, the day is getting to a close. The night is coming. And Philip is there, wondering when are we going to tell these people to go home? Right? It's like your child saying, like, I gotta go. We gotta go. We're gonna meet, we're gonna, we're gonna miss. Or your wife saying, We gotta go. And you're having this conversation with a good friend at church. And you forgot the time. And you forgot that you gotta go and pick up your kids. And I'll say, Oh, we gotta go. We gotta go. You forgot the details. 
So Philip here is assessing that Jesus forgot the details. Jesus had been preaching, been teaching, having this wonderful time where the 20,000 people were there, and Philip is just like, come on, Jesus. Like, we can't just have them being here. If they stay here any bit longer, we're going to have to feed them. We're going to have to take care of them. They can't go into towns. Like, like how are we going to send them away hungry? They should go into towns before this, an hour before, so that they may find some food for themselves. So Jesus knows this, right? Jesus, not only can he read minds, he can read faces. Like you and I can read faces. It's like we know, like you want to go home. I saw your face. I saw that you're just waiting there, waiting for me to cut off this conversation so we can all go home. So Jesus said to Philip, just break the ice. John chapter 6, verse 5. Where, Philip, he said, hey, Philip, he's addressing Philip. Where are we to buy bread so that they may eat? Philip, you seem to be pretty anxious right now. Philip, there's some, some thoughts that you want to say to me, right? There's some things that you want to say to me right now. So, so before, I just, I'm just going to spare you of the trouble. I'm going to open up this conversation, which is I know what you're thinking. Philip, I'm going to present to you this thought, this worry which you are already having. Where are we going to buy bread so that all these people may eat? And did Jesus know this? Did Jesus know that this is a problem? Of course, Jesus is aware. When Jesus is having this conversation, doing his ministry, he knows exactly where this is going. He knows that the people are going to be there. He already has an idea of what he's going to do. But this lesson is not for the people there. It's for Philip. He's letting the people stay so that he may teach Philip something. Because in verse 6, it says, Jesus said this to test him. For he himself knew what he would do. So this conversation that Jesus is bringing up to Philip is for the purpose of testing Philip, right? He, Jesus is staying late, talking to people, letting Philip worry a little bit. And when it's too late in Philip's own mind, Jesus turns to Philip and says, Philip, what are we going to do? It's not that Jesus worries. It's not that Jesus is all of a sudden forgotten. And Philip, I need you to rescue me. You being administrative excellent. Uh, a gifting kind of guy. Now you tell me what I can do. No, Jesus already knows what he's going to do. This is to change Philip's perspective regarding ministry. It's not just run on pragmatism. We must have faith. Faith. So Philip got, a, got something to say to Jesus. He says to Jesus in verse 7, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. So here's Philip, right? Philip's already thought it through. He didn't want to be rude to Jesus. But he's already got it thought through. His administrative mindset is already telling him that we can't do it. 200 denarii is not enough. Why 200 denarii? It's because that might be how much money they have saved up as a group, or maybe how much money that he thinks that he can collect from the 20,000 people. Even that is not enough. Jesus, you put us in a hole. It's too late. Well, I don't know what to do. I already thought this through. There's already like a million possibilities like going on in my head, and none of them is going to work right now. I don't know. But it's at this moment that Andrew brought somebody, right? We saw this last week. A little boy with five loaves of bread and two fish. And with Jesus, that's all that Jesus needed. In verse 11, it says, Jesus then took the loaves. And when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. And also the fish as much as they wanted. Philip had to learn. He had to learn that God does not work within human pragmatism. I mean, God can work within human pragmatism, but he does not always work within human pragmatism because he can bring about the miracles that he wishes to bring about. So to show that it is not man who runs or man who works that can bring about the result but it's who God does and what God does and who God is. 
that can bring about true results in our lives. That is why we're called to pray. We're called to depend upon God. In spite of our shortcomings, in spite of our inabilities, we can trust in God who can do far more than we can do. This is the lesson that Philip must learn. Philip must learn this. Another setting in which Philip must learn that his pragmatism doesn't matter or is not the overwhelming oversight story is found in John chapter 12, verse 20 to 22, in which there's some Greeks who want to come and see Jesus. It says, Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Now why did they come to Philip? Philip, likely, as we see here, was approached by the Greeks because he had a Greek name. The rest of the disciples all had Aramaic or Hebrew names. But Philip was one who had Greek name. Now, he probably had a Hebrew name as well. But here, he's known for his Greek name, which is Philip. And the Gentiles, the Greeks, are coming to Philip because they thought that if we come to a person who has a Greek name, then he is the one who's going to bring us to Jesus. At least that's what we think would be most possible. But Philip hesitated. He didn't know if he should bring these people to Jesus or not because, again, Jews and Gentiles, they don't interact. And what if he brings these people to Jesus? Is that going to put a hindrance to Jesus' ministry? Is that going to cause people to look down upon Jesus and look, upon, look down upon their group? So Philip hesitated, but he wanted to find Andrew. Andrew is the one who's always bringing people to Jesus. So Andrew says, let's do it. But Philip did not have the big picture. Did not have the big picture that God is a God not just of the Jews, but of the Gentiles as well, of the world. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 3, it says, Nations will come to your light, kings to the brightness of your rising. Nations will see God. That is God's desire for the nations. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14, it says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as waters cover the sea. God wants not just the Jews, but the entire earth to know him. So certainly these Gentiles, these Greeks can see Jesus and receive the gospel message. Philip didn't get it. Philip, again, is caught in the trees and was not able to see the forest. The last example of Philip's interaction with Jesus is found in John chapter 14. In what Jesus is in the upper room, and when he is in his upper room, he's telling the disciples what is about to come. He's going to be arrested. He's going to be mocked. He's going to be ridiculed. He's going to be tried. He's going to be crucified. That's what's going to happen. And the disciples are sad because Jesus is telling them, you all will fall away this night because of me. But hold on to me. Hold on to the truth of God. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, In the upper room, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And if you know me, you would have known my Father also. So Jesus is teaching the big picture. Come to him. If you know Jesus, you would know the Father. This is why I'm doing this. I'm giving you the big picture in that you should have a relationship with God through me. But Philip, at this point, got caught up in the details. He's thinking, what can we do so that we don't have to have Jesus go to the cross? What can we do so that we don't have to have this conflicting encounter with the Jews, with the Pharisees? So he said in the very next verse, in verse 8, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Just show us the Father. That's what the Jews are asking, right? You saying that you are in the Father, the Father's in you, 
Father, you are one. You are eternal. So you say all these things and the Jews are trying to stone you and kill you for this because they think that you're blasphemy. But I'm saying that in my pragmatic mindset, all you have to do is show us the Father. And all of a sudden, all these problems are resolved, right? We're happy to follow you. And the Jews were doubting you. They see the Father, and they will be convinced that you and the Father are one. Just show us the Father, and that will be enough. Again, but he's missing the big picture. And Jesus had to bring the big picture back to Philip again. In verse 9, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long that you do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? I'm already showing you the Father. When you see me, you're seeing the Father. That's the point. The reason why the Jews don't believe in God, believe in me, is because they don't believe in the Father. So it makes no difference whether I show them the Father or not because I am. In the Father, and the Father is in me. I am the perfect representation of the Father. So Philip had to get that big picture. I think many of us struggle because we are more like Philip than we will admit to be. I could be like that too. That we're looking at the trees and just wondering like, man, like, if we just do this and all these other things, like Philip is saying, we'll be resolved or we can't do these things because these details don't line up. Instead of having faith in God, instead of having this overall perspective that God reigns and God can do the miracles and God can orchestrate tremendous things outside of our imagination to bring about His perfect will in our lives, instead of having faith in that, we take a step back and say we can't do it or it can't be done. I think about Matt, uh, Martha. Martha is the same person as Philip, the female version of Philip. There was a conversation between Martha and Jesus, all right? You remember that conversation. Martha and Mary invited Jesus and the disciples to go to their home, to have a time of fellowship, a time of encouragement, a time when people can hear the word of God from Jesus. And Mary is there. In Luke chapter 10, verse 39, sitting at the Lord's feet and listening to his teaching while Martha is working hard in the kitchen, making sure that all the details are being done. Got to do this. We got to do that. Got to cook this. Got to cook that to make sure that people have enough to eat and making sure the guacamole is there and the chips are there and people are being entertained and they're comfortable and temperature just right and making sure everything is done to the degree where she becomes frustrated right and this is the problem with pragmatic people it's just like i'm doing everything but let me ask you a question what if you stopped what if it just stopped how much difference would it make and that's exactly what jesus is telling me telling martha Martha tells Jesus, do you not care? Verse 10, verse 40, that my sister had left me to serve alone. Tell her to come help me. We got to, everybody get, get down on this and get this done. But Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things, but only one thing is necessary. What if we don't do it? What if we just don't do it? What if we just don't worry about it? What's going what's gonna to happen? Well, nothing too bad. We know that to be true. Sometimes we make the problem bigger than it is in our own minds, right? Saying, oh, we must do this now. Or what if, what if we just don't do anything? I mean, God is still able to do miraculous work. Even after we rested, after we have taken a break. I think about this church. We think we got to do this and do that. But for so many years, the church was here, and there was no good leadership. And, and perhaps one moment we're talking about today, there was the good news of modern man here in the pews, that there was no Bible that which we have today, the literal translation. And God still did something, 
He still kept it alive till today that we can continue to press forward. How much we do, pragmatically speaking, is that important? Really isn't. It's us able to do what we do, reflection of our heart of worship unto God. That is what's most important. That is why Jesus reminded Martha, saying this in verse 42, Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. If you can just worship God, if you can just focus upon Him, forget about all the other things. Sometimes we do that, right? Like, I can't serve, can't be here for this ministry. Why? Because I got to pick up the kids. I got to take them to piano lessons. I got to pick them up from that. Then I got to take them to sports. I'm going to pick them up from sports. And after that, there's other activity. I'm just, just going at it all day, all night. Adding busyness and busyness to our lives, not realizing that what if we just take a step back and just stop? That's what Mary did. That's what Mary did. It was a good thing which will not be taken away from her. Stop and just worship. Worship. What if we didn't have great music? What if we didn't have comfortable seating? What if we don't have AC? What if, what if we don't have whatever? What if we just have the Word of God? And what if we just have people encouraging one another in the Spirit and fellowshipping? What if that's all that we have? We don't have any food here. What if there's no preparation in the kitchen at all? And people just hear for the Word of God and encourage them to one another. What if we just had that? What if we were just singing songs unto the Lord a cappella, and because we just arise from our heart? What if we didn't even practice some during the week and just say, hey, let's sing the song, and that the worship is even better than when we did? It's not about us making it happen. It's about Jesus who already is making it happen through the gospel, and all we have to do is make sure that we hang on to that gospel and not forget that it's about him and not us. John three sixteen, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Do we focus on the only son? If we have that, then we have enough. Jesus also said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 to 33, we tend to be anxious about life. We need to do this, we need to do that, we need to make sure of this, make sure of that. Saying, what shall we eat? What should we drink? What should we wear? If we, if we don't do these things, we're not going to have things to eat. We're not going to have things to wear. We're going to have the things to drink. Jesus says, hey, your heavenly Father knows that you need, them all, you need them all, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Keep it simple, guys. That's what Jesus is saying. Seek after the kingdom of God. Since when has God failed you? Never. Never. So keep it simple. Have that personal devotion with God. Praise God. Meditate upon the truth of God. Go to that beach or go up to the mountain and take your journal and your Bible and just, just worship and, and remember that it's not about what you do but what God does through you. We have to do something, but it has to be done for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, it says, whether you eat or drink and whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. But we also must realize that the moment anxiousness comes to our hearts, saying, I have to do this, I have to do that. And that's no longer for the glory of God because now it depends upon you to make it happen versus upon God who's at work through you. So again, it's a change of mindset. We have to pull back always to ask ourselves the question, am I still worshiping? Am I still trusting? Am I still depending upon God? We don't want to ever get so strong in our ability that we think that we can handle it, right? I can do everything. No. We can't do anything, but it's God who works through us. So Philip needed to learn this. He's this pragmatic, perhaps very gifted person in his pragmatism, administrative expert, seeing different things at one time, able to multitask. That's Philip. But he had to learn that even his skill set is by itself not the end all be all in the kingdom of God. He has to trust in God in the big picture. 
But he had a good friend who was a big picture thinker, and his name's Bartholomew. Or, in other words, Nathaniel, who is a big picture mindset kind of a guy who is perhaps Philip's best friend in ministry. We're going to see him here. Verse 3, Philip and Bartholomew. So who is Bartholomew? Well, Bartholomew is two words put together. The word bar is the word son. And Tholomew is the word, well, Tholomew. Literally, is that he is a son of Solomon or son of Tholomaeus. Like Jesus bar Joseph. Jesus is his name, but bar son of Joseph. So Bartholomew says, uh, literally says that he's son of Tholomew, but his name actually is Nathaniel. Nathaniel. He's found or had an interaction with Jesus in John chapter 1, verse 46, in which Philip went to Nathaniel and said, We found the Messiah. Verse 45, he said, We found him, who Moses in the law, also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So Nathaniel here is introduced to Jesus. But what was Nathaniel's first encounter like? Well, at first, Nathaniel just said, I don't really think that he is the Christ. Because this broad stroke, big picture kind of a guy, he's not like Philip, who is detail-oriented, thinking about exceptions and details and possibilities. He's just thinking big picture, saying, okay, this is the way it is, and this is the way that it always has been. And he's not diving into the details. And so when Philip introduced Jesus to Nathaniel, saying he is from Nazareth, Philip said in John chapter, four, uh, John chapter 1, verse 46, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I don't believe it. His broad stroke kind of mind is riving off everybody in that northern town of Israel. And he's probably right to the most case, 99% of the time. Nazareth is the last town that you will go to before you head into the Gentile territory. No place in, in, in history of Israel and, and no place at that time in people's mind that there's any kind of astute, theologically astute kind of guy coming out of Nazareth. No one. And so it's not a place that you look for the Messiah. If you look for the Messiah, you look for him in Jerusalem or Judea region, not in Nazareth. Can anything good come out of a, a town where there's no theological discussion and and, and, and and discussion regarding truth. These are just the hoi polloi's, people doing their regular common jobs. And we, we don't think that anything good can come out of Nazareth. But Philip, being a good friend of Nathaniel, said, hey, I, I need you to show. I know you're writing him off, but come and see. He's the exception. Verse 46, come and see. So he grabs Nathaniel and says, I need you to come. Nathaniel says, I don't really want to go. Come, come, come. All right, I'm coming. And Nathaniel at the time, by the way, is probably praying. We'll talk about this at the, uh, later on. But he comes to see Jesus. In verse 47, Jesus saw Nathaniel and made this comment initially to Nathaniel before Nathaniel is able to say anything saying, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit, saying to Nathaniel. Nathaniel says, how, what? See, it turns out that Nathaniel was indeed such a person. Nathaniel in his broad stroke kind of mindset, big picture kind of mindset, is set apart from all the other religious leaders we see in Jerusalem who are in the details and seeking to manipulate people on the religiosity, Right? We even saw this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 2, verse 5, verse 16. You saw the Pharisees who are manipulating people, praying in front of people, giving in front of people, fasting in front of people. And this kind of mindset is a kind of mindset which is manipulative. And generally, people who are broad stroke kind of guy, they don't manipulate people. They're just being who they are. They wear their emotions on their sleeves. But the Pharisees, they're not like that. They're giving in front of people, Matthew chapter 6, verse 2, to be seen by others. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, praying to be seen by others. Matthew chapter 6, verse 16, fasting to be seen by others, right? They're pretending. They're giving on the street corners, giving in the synagogues, and, 
give in front of people again with their manipulative mindset, and they feel says, I don't, I don't get that. I don't even know how I can even do that. That's impossible. That's, that's just wrong. I'm a broad show kind of guy, big picture kind of guy. I'm just thinking that we just need the Messiah, pray to God, having a pure heart before God. That's all that I want. All that I want. So when Jesus said to Nathaniel, truly you are an Israelite without deceit, Nathaniel knew that Jesus knows something about him. So Nathaniel asked the question in verse 48. It's like, well, you're right, but how do you know me? How do you come to this assessment? How did you know this is who I am? And Jesus said in verse 48, Before Philip called you, while you were under the fig tree, I saw you. He said, what? What does that have to do anything? Like, I saw you under the fig tree. That's how I know you. No, there's something more to it, right? See, what Nathaniel was doing was that he was praying. The fig tree was known to be a place of prayer. Not just one fig tree, fig trees in general. They grow up to be about 15 to 20 feet high. And when people want to get out of that hustle and the bustle within the home, when people are just having this conversation, they just go to a quiet place. And the quiet place they can go to is under a fig tree. And Nathaniel was praying to God, pouring his heart out to God. And, and, and pouring out his love unto God, saying, I love you, the, O Lord. And you know who he is praying to? Jesus, because Jesus is God. So Jesus heard Nathaniel's prayer, and this is what it means. When you are under the fig tree, praying as a true Israelite, a man without deceit, with a pure heart unto the Lord, I heard you, I saw you. And when Nathaniel heard this, he was convinced. He's like, if you know that much about me, in verse 49, he said, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. I'm in. And from this point on, you don't ever see Nathaniel mentioned anywhere else in Scripture. You don't see him asking a question. You don't see him doubting Jesus. I mean, he ran away like the rest of the disciples, yes, but he never opened his mouth ever again. You could say, is it because that he... He's satisfied with everything that Jesus told him. I think he is. He's good. You don't need to show me anything else. You don't need to show me the Father like Philip does. No, no, I'm good. I know that you are the Messiah. I'm good. I'm a simple-minded, broad-stroke, big-picture kind of guy. I know that, Jesus, you are the Messiah. I'm going to follow you. So no more interaction. And the silence of Nathaniel speaks much to his personality, right, in the Bible. But Jesus had to teach him. Say, hey, I know that you're a big stroke kind of a guy. You're the big picture guy. But I want to share with you something. So Jesus continues on in verse 50. He said, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You are going to see greater things than these. He said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heaven opened. And the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. You are going to see greater things. You might think you don't need to see anything else. This is good enough for you. No, no. Alongside with the big picture, yes, that I am the Messiah. I want to show you, I want you to show you even greater miracles than these. Greater events than these. Details of my glory and my kingdom expressed under the foundation or above the foundation of the fact that I am the Messiah. I need to show you these to build up your faith and to build up your worship unto God. You are going to see, Jesus said in verse 51, Heavens open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son. Amen. What Jesus is doing here is quoting from Genesis chapter 28, verse 12, in which Jacob was out by himself, and he was alone. He had this encounter with God. He dreamed, and he dreamed that there was a ladder from earth, to heaven. And there was angels of God ascending and descending upon this ladder. And that ladder is who? Is Jesus. Jesus is this ladder. 
He is the one who angels are ascending and descending, interacting with men, doing miracles upon earth. There is no reason why God would have anything to do with you or his angels would have anything to do with you if not for the very fact that Jesus is the bridge between God and man. So Jesus says, on this foundation of the ladder of God, me being the ladder, you will see many, many more miracles in, along, in light of this, alongside of this, in conjunction to this. And you need to know this. You need to grow. You need to learn. There's still much for you to experience. I think about this, and this could be the growth that we need in our lives as well, right? When you first become a Christian, you're thinking, you know what? I know Jesus now. Jesus is my king. He's my Lord. I believe unto him, and I'm sharing the gospel with people and uh, telling them to follow God, and they are. They're coming to me, and I'm sharing with them, and I have the discipleship group, and, and, and we're all just praying and, 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 and having this wonderful fellowship. And that's good. You don't need to know a whole lot about theology to do that. And there's a whole lot of theology besides that, but I remember back in the days I was in college and I just, you know, recently became a believer when I was in, in high school and I went to college and, and I had, you know, a, a personality in which I, I was uh, drawing some people to, to, to God and through uh, my gifting and, and singing some songs and, and, and my gifting in, in reading the Bible and, exp- and, my, and being able to communicate that. And I thought that's all that I needed. There were seminary guys who were coming to the Bible study. I felt like I was more productive in my ministry than these knowledgeable, quote-unquote, guys. And eventually I thought, okay, well, you know what? I want to go into ministry, so I went to seminary. I say that to my shame, half the seminary class I slept through. <laughs> I say, well, really? You still got a GPA? I did, but, I, you know, I was just like, I just didn't find it to be interesting because I thought, you know what? I'm already in ministry, I'm already doing all these things and people are already coming to me and I'm already being productive, effective for the ministry of God. What do these college professors have to teach me? They have nothing to offer. I mean, I'm doing all right already. Only to find out years later on, like I wish I can go back and I still do go back because some of these courses are recorded so I'm going back onto the course and getting the videos and listening to them again and finding it's so Helpful that I would know what they're teaching. The languages, the theology, the, the, the debates that people have and, and, and the difficulties of scriptures and, and understanding them. That it is worthwhile to dive in. In humility, of course. And so the call for us is that, yes, we know the big picture, but are we building on top of it? with the details that we need to know and not despise them because every detail of Scripture points to Jesus Christ. We were talking about this in our theology class or in our uh, Wednesday night Bible study, bibliology, right? If you know this truth, how do this truth in Scripture actually draw you to worship Jesus more? Of course, the truth which we learn could promote pride, but God is telling Nathaniel, hey, don't devalue them. Don't devalue other nuances of scripture which you can know that would honor christ and and draw more people to worship him and and help you to be the way those who are distracting the body of christ the wolves the wolves are using some of the unknown parts of scripture and making them the main point if you don't know how these scriptures are supposed to be interpreted then the wolves are going to come in and distract the people of God. So you need to know the details. As you know the details, and you yourself are worshiping God, and you're being better equipped to lead God's people. I think about this creation. This creation is full of the big pictures of God's glory, but it's also filled with the details of God's glory as well. Psalm chapter 19, verse 1 through 2, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Right? 
The glory of God is seen in the heavens. The glory of God is seen in the mountains. The glory of God is seen in, in what we see before us. Trees, forests, moon, stars. But verse 2, it says, Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There's more and more speech, more and more knowledge that's been expressed through God's creation. You can take a microscope and look at something really, really small, and there's more of God's glory even to be told in that. Every detail of God's creation is there to express something about God. That is why when we read the Puritans, right, some of you read the Puritans, like, gosh, like, you guys are just repeating the same thing over and over and over again. You can't stand these old Puritan books, but these people are grinding it, right? They're grinding these details, trying to get at the nugget, every least that they can to cause their hearts to worship God even more. So it's good to read these old books, to wonder, to contemplate, to think deeply, about God. As far as the body of Christ is concerned, I think the big picture guy must learn to appreciate every person. See, Philip knows. Philip knows that I need you, I need you, I need you, I need you to do these things. Without you, we can't do these things. The big picture guy, Nathaniel, just say, ah, we don't need anybody. Just, just, just come in and everything will be worked out just fine. Maybe he will, but maybe he won't because, you know, sometimes... It's in the details, right? Like we need to know what is happening. Why things aren't working It's in detail so that you don't get tripped up when some of the things aren't happening. And God has revealed that the body of Christ is full of the big picture, yes, of us glorifying God, but details of individual members who are serving one another and serving God in their individual ways. And the, the challenge for Nathaniel is to appreciate everybody in how they should be appreciated because of the individual gifting. And say, I thank you for doing that. I noticed that you did that. And this wouldn't have gone well if not you doing that and noticing that and, and coming alongside of that in the background. See, we need people like Philip to encourage us, say, hey, you noticed us and what we do, but people like Nathaniel who must learn to appreciate people and not just, oh, it's going oh, to happen because it just always happens. No, it Took, takes work from individuals who are pouring their lives out in very detail-oriented way to make the church function. I mean, there are a million things that went on. Not a million, but many things went on by people, served by people before the service could happen. And it's my job to thank people in what they're doing. And I hope that you see what people are doing and thank them for what they're doing and not just taking it for granted. It doesn't always just happen. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14, the body does not consist of one member, but of many, right? And I, he said in verse 21, cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. We need one another. Verse 17 and 18, it says, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. We all have a purpose before God. Doing the one specific detail-oriented thing that contribute to the well-being of the entire body of Christ. So you see, Philip needs Nathaniel. Nathaniel needs Philip. We all need each other. Philip contributes by helping us count the cost. We need to know the cost. We need to know the work that is involved and the people who are committed to do the work. If we're going to have a picnic, hey, we're going we're gonna to have to work out some of the details. So Philip is necessary. Even Jesus said in Luke chapter 14, verse 28, which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost whether he has enough to complete it? Or, he said in verse 31, what king going out to encounter another king in the war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000, right? We have to count the cost. It's not to say that we need 20,000. Maybe all that we need is 300, like Gideon, but at least we know that, hey, we're only going in with 300 and the rest we're trusting God for, but... We need to be praying, right? Acknowledging that, yes, we only have 300. 
And the rest, we got to trust God. So Philip says, hey, guys, I just want you to know we only have so little. But I'm okay. I'm with you. But we need to know we only have so little. So hang on tight. You know, we gotta, we, we're going to face some realities, right? But we trust God is able to rescue us. And Nathaniel is needed, of course, because Nathaniel can compliment Philip. In Luke chapter 10, verse 42, we see Jesus saying, only one thing is necessary. Philip, I got what you're saying, but only one thing is necessary. Can we trust God that we can do this? Yes. Okay, let's do it. Let's just go for it. Let's see. Nathaniel is valuable as well. So we see either one or the other, right? Maybe some of us more like Nathaniel. Maybe some of us are more like Philip. But we can encourage one another in this. Count the cost, but we're still walking faithfully toward Christ. History tells us that these two people ministered together. Traditions says that they were ministering in Assyria, Phrygia, Greece, locations. And while both of them were in Heropolis, which is sitting in Greece, Philip shared the gospel with the wife of the proconsul of that city, which resulted in her salvation. As a result, the proconsul got really upset, and so the proconsul commanded that Philip and Nathaniel be crucified on that cross. So as both of them were hanging on their individual crosses, people were passing by. And they both were sharing the gospel with people who were passing by. As a result, people were so convinced by the gospel which they shared, they wanted to let Philip and Nathaniel down. They got Nathaniel to come down, but Philip said, you know what? I'm going to stay here on the cross. And Philip died. But Nathaniel continued to work. Nathaniel then eventually went to Armenia, in which he shared the gospel with the king of Armenia and resulted in the salvation of that king. But the brother of the king was very upset that the king was converted, so he had Philip filleted and beheaded. But we can even see the result, right, of the ministry. Armenia was the first nation to declare Christianity as their government religion. And Bartholomew is the patron saint of Armenia. So we see God at work in each of these people's lives. As God is at work in their lives, powerfully working through them, even though they're weak, even though they have their spiritual inclinations, that which are not necessarily perfect in the very beginning. God challenged them, shaped them to be more and more useful servants of his, and he is doing that in our lives today as well. All we are called to do is to step forward and say, God, use me as well. It's about in the word of prayer. Our Father, we are thankful that we get to study through these men, their lives. And the reason why we're studying it is not because we adore and worship these men. No, these are weak men. They are men with many faults. But this encourages us in a way in which as we compare ourselves with these men, we know that we are also like them, men and women with many faults. But when we step out in faith, when we say, God, use me, and I'm going to do it anyhow, God begins to do miraculous things in us to shape us and make us into whom he wants us to be more and more effective for his kingdom. Thank you, Jesus, for your work in our lives, making us into more and more effective servants of yours. And we want to be. We want to be for your glory. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.